be assembled with, with such a nice people. And I am I feel very honored uh, to be assembled here with this a group of men and women this morning. And while we were eating breakfast, as it seems to be that I always think of this, I uh, hear each one give their testimony. And sometimes I heard a man right up here at the end of the table say, I said something to him last night or something. Is one of those men, at least the man sitting right there. And a lady over here said that I prayed for her. Now that seems to, I dreamed it, it just way back. It's something that I may ex try to explain the best I can in a few moments. But as I sit here and thought of the doctor there, his testimony, and at the jail services, and this man is a Methodist from my mother's church, and, and the Church of God there, the brother said, and the, and the different ministers, the young fellow over there, and this brother here, and just so many of you, all of you, our colored brother here, and how that it just gives you something. And I think as we sit here this morning as men and women, we, we have one motive, and that's to the further the cause of Christ. That's, that's why we are here. Okay. And we are not divided, though our denominations may mean different, but we are all one in His grace. Okay. So much of my time, uh, my... My mother's mother came from the reservation, and there's been something in me that loves the outdoors. As you know, I'm a hunter, and I've rode and done much riding. My father was a rider. And up on in Kremlin, Colorado, back on Troublesome River, we had the Hereford Association grazes at uh, the Troublesome River Valley, and uh, I have rode much in years back in there. And we have a drift fence where all the, the association rides their cattle in. If you can raise a, a ton of hay, you can graze a cow on the, on the reptile forest. And I've noticed the ranger standing there as he counted each man and his brands that went by. And as I've sat there many times with my leg over the horn of the saddle watching and seeing him count those cattle as they go through, I see him come through with a tripod that was ours. Turkey Track, that was another ranch up the river. The Diamond T, the Lazy R, the many different brands. Everything went through it, and they had different brands, but every one of them was Hereford. That's what I think of today. See, we, we might be different branded, but we're all Christians at heart. Nothing goes in there unless he's a registered Hereford. He can't go through the gate unless he's a registered Herbert. And we can go in the gates, no matter what we are in brands, as long as we are born again Christian. And looking across the table here and seeing some of the man that's perhaps maybe just a little older than I, and some of you men even that's younger than I, were preaching this marvelous full gospel, as we call it before I came in on the scene and to hear the remarks and the respects that I realize you don't say to me as a man, you're giving them to God for his kindness of his gift that I am with you in ministering. But did you realize this road that's so smooth that I'm riding on now, you man laid it when you were on the street corner with a guitar? years ago and were kicked about from pillar to post, you men and women laid that foundation that I'm only trying to build on. And here I stand as one born out of season, just a young man in the age of the ministry that you are in, and here you're letting me speak to you when really you are the one who laid the foundation. See? 
Then I look this morning and see these aged men and women as they have preached when I was just a little Baptist preacher or maybe before there, and accepting me as your brother, and, and what a feeling it is to get together where people don't think that you're a devil or a spook or something, that you're, you're a brother, and they, they understand it, and it just makes me feel so good. I have to be, uh, I want to be, and it's in my heart to be loyal to my calling. And then when I see someone welcome you, then you know how it makes you feel, see? Oh, such a love that flows to a brother like that and sister. When you feel that something that you know that comes from God that it, you're trying to give to the people and with a heart they just embrace it, how it makes you feel to them. It's, it's just something. And as I look around the table here and think this is a breakfast, I don't know whenever we'll be like this again. We may never in this life be like this again. And I'm thinking of nine o'clock and the business, one of the businessmen sitting there said, come over and said, I must leave at nine, Brother Branham, because I've got some Christian things he had to do for Christian people. And I thought, well, just a little while and then we'll be separated again. But as the poet said, we'll still be jarred and hard. Amen. and hope to meet again. You've sang that old song, many of you, Blessed be the tie that binds. And I thought, will we meet again then? Yes, brethren. Amen. We'll meet again. And it will not altogether be a breakfast. We're told it'll be a supper. Amen. And as when at last, when it's all over and our toils are finished, and we come up into his house, and we're going to eat supper with him, drink the fruit of the vine and, and eat anew in his kingdom. When I think of the time when it's all over, we're in the heat of the day now and toiling hard. And when it's all over and I look across the table and see you, man, oh, what a feeling that's going to be when we look at each other. And I know that it's all over. and. Uh, we'll no doubt reach across the table and kind of grip each other's hands, a, a little tear of joy run down our cheeks, then to think the king and his beauty shall walk out, wipe all tears from our eyes, say, don't cry anymore, children, it's all over, enter into the joys of the Lord. Uh, that's, a, that's a time that I look forward to. That's when I uh, look at that time, to hear him say, it was well done, my good and faithful servants. Now I enter into the joys of the Lord. What a time it will be to see the gray hairs fading out then to young man again, to know that we'll live and reign with him forever. Now today, in this privilege that we have of being together, some brother here, I believe, from Canada and from different Tennessee and this little group around from every little crevice. and. To see this setting and want a card like this, it would just be a time for Pentecost again, you see, for a fresh anointing, which I feel that the Pentecostal blessing is in here. Someone has often said to me, Brother Bram, do you belong to the Pentecostal church? I said, Pentecost is not a denomination. Pentecost is an experience that man receives everywhere. And it, it, isn't, it isn't segregated from the rest of the churches. It's it's a blessing that should be in every heart, and man do hunger for that. And Brother Vale said we was having a ministerial breakfast this morning, and uh, some of the brothers and sisters were going to gather in for, for a little time of fellowship. And you know, it was such a wonderful thing till, I, as a soldier, I left my sword at home. <laughs> So I just, that's my Bible. And so uh, I, I knew that we were be seated together in heavenly places anyhow in Christ. And I thought maybe this morning for just a few moments talk, I guess we should be cleared out in the next few moments. But being as you, you brethren are ministers, 
and far more capable of speaking the word than I am, because I am a spare tire. See, just um, you know what you use a spare tire for, you see. So we don't have any puncture this morning, so we don't necessarily need the spare tire. But I thought I would try to report to you upon some things that our Heavenly Father is doing in, in the places which I thought would be more of an interest to you, brethren, than to try to take a text or something and talk to you from. And the text that I would think in my mind, if it be any, would be Mark 16. And what a, a marvelous text it is. It's the last commission to the church. When God first commissioned his church, Christ, in Matthew 10, he gave them power over unclean spirits and to heal the sick and so forth. That was his first commission. His last commission was to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, a man tried to say that day is finished, but there's only one-third of the world's ever heard of Christ so far to all the world and to every creature. And these signs shall follow them that believe, said Jesus. And I know it's not good, and I don't think that the gospel deserves to be told jokes, so I wouldn't want you to class this as a joke, but just something that comes to my mind of a recent event. There was a young boy who went off to school to get his education to be a minister. And which was all right, if it's the right kind of a school that'll teach him the right thing. And so many of our so well, I I have you know I have no education. I'm, I have a seventh grade education, so I can't speak before man of your caliber uh, and use the right words. But I, I hope the Holy Spirit lets you know what I mean. This, the schools, it's just so formal and in a different kind of a social gospel-like, and they don't, uh, they don't um, teach the full Word of God. The boy would probably be better off stay home and stay on his knees. Okay. But <clears throat> this young fellow in his schooling, his mother taken sick while he was gone, and she got very ill with a pneumonia. And so she... Um, she had said, they sent word to her son to stand by. He may be called home at any time, for the doctor said that there was nothing he could do. He gave her penicillin and, and, and put her in an oxygen tent, and she still was fading away. And the boy was ready to leave from a famous college and, and come home and to his mother. And all of a sudden, she got a telegram that she was, had recovered and was all right. And so... Uh, on the vacation time, the young gent come home to see his mother, and he come in. He said, "Mother, I would like to ask you something." He said, "When you were so sick, said why? Uh, what happened all at once? What did the doctor give you to make you get well so quick?" I was already packed my suitcase when I got the, the telegram that you were well, and said, I, "You never did explain it to me." She said, "Honey." She said, just down the street and around the corner in the kind of the lower part of the town, of course, said uh, there's a little mission around there, a place called Full Gospel, and said there was a lady said that she felt real definitely led to come and see me. And she asked me if I believed in prayer, uh, praying for the sick. And I told her that, uh, of course, if the Bible said so, I believed it. And she said, our pastor prays for the sick. So it said they sent the pastor up, and he read to me out of the Bible in the book of Mark, the 16th chapter, and said, these signs shall follow them that believe. said, he prayed for me and laid hands on me and said, honey, the fever left me, and I got well. And, uh, oh, he said, mother, of course, said, uh, you, uh, you're not associated with them people anymore, are you? And uh, said they are from a, a lower caliber than what we belong. And, uh, oh, she said, praise God, honey. She said, it's just wonderful. I go to the mission now. <laughs> oh, he said, mother said, why, you shouldn't do that. Said, uh, you must understand that those people are a, a more the illiterate type, you see. He said, you shouldn't do that. Why, he, she said, well, hallelujah, son. He said, mother, you shouldn't say that. 
He said, you're beginning to act like those people. He said, you shouldn't say that. And, uh, and uh, he said, now you see, he said, as far as she said, well, honey, said they have divine healings and said these services and oh, you should see how the Lord blesses them. Oh, he said, Mother said, now that scripture he read to you from Mark, the 16th chapter, she said, yes, and here it is right here. The Bible said so. Oh, he said, you see, he said, those ministers of that caliber said, they're not educated. And he said, uh, us better scholars understand that uh, Mark 16 from the ninth verse on is not inspired. Said it was just added by the Vatican and so forth. Said it's really not inspired. Said, uh... There's no history that says that it was added uh, or put in there and said it was just added from the ninth verse on is not inspired. And she said, well, hallelujah. <laughs> and uh, why he said, mother, the very audacity said, why you are, why he said, it's why I'm ashamed of you. She said, I was just thinking something, son. So what was you thinking, mother? Well, I said, if. If God could heal me with that scripture is not inspired, what could he do to me to that which really is inspired? So, <laughs> I think that's just about the way it is, you see, that it is inspired. And it was a great thing that happened. Did any of you ever know Marsh Reedhead? Meant most, I guess some of you are. He a, was a vice president of the Sudan Missions of the Baptist. You might are. You know Reedhead, didn't you? And... Uh, Don Wells, after he had received the Holy Ghost, and you know Don Wells there from Chattanooga, surely he's got the biggest Baptist church there is down there. He had received the baptism of the Holy Ghost under Reedhead. And Dr. Reedhead came to my house and he said, Now I said, Brother Branham, he said, I want to ask you something. And some Jewish brother, and they were with some man from Ohio. This Jewish brother had a business here in Ohio. I forget what his name is, which was a personal friend to Hyman Appleman. And um, so they came to my house and he said, now, of course, being a Baptist, now that's no throw, see. Now, I remember the reason that I just kind of stuck with the Baptist church was the sovereignty of the local church, what I think is apostolic, you see. Now, it is the Baptist we have in there. I, I don't even tend the fellowships, but in the Baptist church is not a denomination. It's not supposed to be. It is now. But it was not supposed to be a denomination. It's a brotherhood, and the and it's the sovereignty of the local church. And I, and if God is ever going to get a message to his man, his elder, which is a, according to the Bible, the the highest office in the local church is the elder. And now with coming through, the elder has to go to the state Presbyterian and so forth, and on back to the bishop, and then it's wrote near. We believe this, period, that's all. As Dr. Bose said here one time, we wrote our uh, our ritual or whatever what it is, their belief will end it with a comma. We believe this plus as much as the Lord can show us. Amen. So that's the way I kind of like that. And then in, the, in this, Dr. Reedhead came in. He said, Now, Brother Branham, being a, a Baptist farmer, surely you'd know something about our message. I said, yes, sir. He said, now, when I was a little boy of seven, the Lord called me. And I think Dr. Vail here is a, a you know, Dr. Reedhead, well knowing. He said, there was a little uh, boy I was called to the ministry. He said, then I studied and I longed my little heart longing for God. He said, then when I Finally, got my B.A., so I thought surely I'd find that thing that I wanted right there in the, my B.A. And said, but when I got my B.A., he said, I, I didn't get what I wanted. He said, then when he was, uh, had his other uh, degrees give to him, he said, I thought maybe that in each of these degrees I would find Christ. He said, and with honorary degree and so forth, said, I could almost plaster your wall with him. He said, but where is Christ in it all? He said, has the teachers been wrong, Brother Branham? I said, I wouldn't say that. See, I wouldn't want to take something because people put that confidence in you to support your ignorance uh, by the crutches of saying something like that. I wouldn't want to do that. I said, no, I wouldn't want to say the teachers is wrong and uh, so forth. 
But Christ doesn't lay in BAs or DDs or LDs. See, Christ lays and dwells in a humble heart. See, and He said, "I tell you what I'm here for." He said, some time ago, a young Indian boy who had been schooled and was going back to India and to be a help to his nation. He said, this young Indian, when he was going back, I said to him, sir, why don't you, he was a Hindu, and he said, why don't you just uh, forsake that old dead prophet you got, Mohammed, and uh, accept uh, Jesus of Nazareth, a resurrected Christ. Well, he said the Mohammed looked kindly down. He looked up. He said, Kind sir, what could your Jesus do for me any more than what my prophet can do? Uh, Christian brethren and sisters, listen to this. He said, What could your Jesus do for me any more than my prophet can do? He said, One wrote a book that you call the Bible. You read it and believe it. The other one wrote the book called the Koran. We read it and believe it. He said, Now, both promise life after death, and we both believe it. He said, Now, what could your prophet or your Christ do for us any more than our prophet? Well, Dr. Reed had said, Well, said your prophet is laying there dead in the grave. And perhaps maybe some of you travelers have seen the same as I. They keep a white horse at the grave and have for right at 2,000 years expecting Muhammad to rise and conquer the world. The horse guard changes every so many hours, and um, he's in the grave. And he was a believer in God, only the Mohammed priest, when he rings the big bong on top of the building, he says, there's one true and living God, and Mohammed is his prophet. We say there's one true and living God, and Jesus is his son. And that's the difference. And so uh, he said, now what could your Jesus do for me any more than he? Why, he said, our Jesus raised from the dead. And your prophet is in the grave. He said, that's the difference. Why, he said, did he raise in the grave? He said, I'd like to see you prove it. Oh, he said, well, the tomb's empty. He said, oh, in India we got thousands of those, <laughs> which they have. That's right, they claim. Virgin births, oh my, my. It's stacked piles of literature that high on virgin births and so forth. And there is more virgin births besides Christ. Every bee that's born almost at the second droning is virgin. No male contact at all. And why wow, the virgin birth is such a question in people's mind when there's virgin birth all along. So then Christ was the virgin born Son of God. And so then we, um, he said, then I said to him, well, you see, he said, uh, now what could your Christ give to me any more than what my prophet has given. Well, he said, now, we can prove he's, he's raised from the dead. So we can prove it. Well, he said, I'd like to see you do it, and then we'll believe it. Mm -hmm. He said, well, he lives in my heart. Well, he said, Mohammed lives in mine. He said, but you see, we got joy and, and gladness, and we, we can have a victory in he said, now, just a moment, Mr. Reedhead, said, the Mohammed religion can produce just as much psychology as Christianity can. And our brethren, you know that's the truth. He said, we can be just as, oh, I've seen them when they would, at the Feast of the Prophets, when they'd even take a lance and run through their nose up like that and pull it back, not even a drop of blood, shout and scream and go on and everything. Oh, sure, certainly. And see much of psychology. That's right. Even in Africa where they had the devil worship, where they drink blood out of a human skull and call the power of the devil. And why, well, it was a hideous thing to be around even. See, how the witch doctors challenge you. Right out there. You better know what you're talking about. Amen. You, bet, you can play it here That's right. Amen. and just act like it. But when you come face to face with the thing, you better know what you're speaking of. Amen. See? I'm that's what I'm trying to say to my brethren this morning. Brethren, we had the churches bubble dance long enough, you see. We got to get down to something real. See, them things are all right. It's the joy of the Lord many times instead of the power of the Lord, see. And um, so then, 
Mr. Reed had said, well, um, he said, now, I mean, the Hindu said, you see, Mr. Reed had, he said, Mohammed never made any promise to his followers, only life after death. But said, your Jesus made other promises. He said that you teachers would do the same thing that he did. And he said, then um, uh, perhaps maybe if you people could prove that, then we would believe he raised from the dead. Or, and Mr. Reedhead said, if you all know him, he'd take him to this same scripture. He said, oh, I guess you're referring, seeing that you've read the Bible. Said, oh, he said, I've read it through and through many times, the Mohammed said. He said, well, uh, perhaps you're referring to Mark 16. He said, that's just one of them. <laughs> that's just one of them. How about um, Mark 11, 24, <laughs> and so forth, and others? St. John 14, 12, many others, you see, where he said that the Scripture, Christ made these promises. That we Mohammeds are waiting to see you Christians produce that, then we'll believe that you're Jesus raised from the dead. He said, until that, don't try to sell a Mohammed your psychology, because we got a better. <laughs> and he said, Brother Branham, he said, I kicked the dust like that with my feet and changed the subject. No, I wasn't speaking to a fellow that was just an overnight man. He knew what he was talking about. And he said, you produce what your Bible... And so Mr. Reed had said, well, if you're referring to Mark 16, said, we, find, we really know that... It's some of uh, that part of the scripture especially isn't inspired. You've heard it, brethren, and they try to throw off Mark 16 there. Uh, even, uh, even in the Schofield notes you read, the footnotes, and many of the scholars try to throw that out. And you know what that Mohammed said? He said, it isn't. You mean from the ninth verse on is not inspired? He said, no, it isn't inspired. So then what kind of a book is your Bible? He said, all the Koran's inspired. My... What it is, brethren, is man's challenge of faith who knows where they're standing positionally to call that thing to a showdown. That Bible's either ever word inspired or it's none of it inspired. If this isn't and that isn't, what part can you believe? I don't believe it all or I don't believe any. You're either my brethren this morning or you're not. I'm your brother or I am not. There's no halfway between with God. We are either here for our purpose to further the cause of Christ, or we're not, see. And that's the way the Scripture should be taught and practiced and believed. And he said, I said, someday I would come visit you, and said, here I am. He said, is there such a thing as receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost? I said, yes, sir. He said, when can you get it? I said, when you want it. And Mars Reed has, has received the baptism of the Holy Ghost and even having healing services himself. And there it is, brethren. The world, the two-thirds of the world that's never heard the name of Christ. He said, now you've had 2,000 years to prove that Jesus raised from the dead, and one-third of the world has heard it in 2,000 years. He said, let Muhammad raise from the dead, and the whole world will know it in 24 hours. He's right. Whose fault is it, brethren? Whose fault is it? Now, if you'll excuse me, if you scholars and to myself, I uh, and not a, uh, an educated person, may I say this, it's our fault. Amen. That's right. Because we've done vice versa what Christ told us to do. Now, we know that it's nice to have churches. That's wonderful. We know it's nice to have denominations. They're wonderful. It's nice to have, um, to have uh, seminaries. It's wonderful, but Christ never told us to build any seminary or anything like that. He said, preach the gospel. And the gospel isn't word only, but through power and manifestation of the Holy Spirit, which would produce the signs of Mark 16, when he said, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, these signs shall follow them. The word itself is dead until it becomes into an action and produces life. And say, if the corn of wheat fall into the ground, it abides alone. And then when the word is brought into a heart of faith that makes that every promise in the Bible live again, see, it, it'll, it, it's got to live. It's a germatized word, and it must live if it's received in the right place. 
under the right conditions, ever see to live again if it's put under the right conditions. And brethren, may I say this with reverence and respect to you as my brethren, knowing that maybe before night we'll all stand at the judgment seat of Christ in heaven. And look, may I say this, that it's the atmosphere always that brings forth the, the product. See, the hen, the actual way for a hen to have her chickens is to, for the hen to lay the egg and then cover it with her body. And that makes the warmth of the hen's body hatches the egg. But you can put it under an e- in an incubator. It's the same warmth and atmosphere, see. It'll produce that chicken just the same. And I don't care for the, some of the Methodists or the Baptists or the Presbyterian, the atmosphere of the Word. If the Word, which is the egg, and if the right atmosphere, if it's in a Presbyterian or wherever it's at, it'll produce the same results. It'll produce the born-again child. You know that is right, brethren. Whether it's under the Pentecostal, the full gospel, or wherever it is, it's the, it's the attitude that we take towards God's divine word. Uh, many of you have heard of John Sproul. He was a good friend of mine. He said at La Salle Rains one time when he was uh, being taken out uh, by the guide through a garden, and he saw a great statue of Christ and said he stood off and criticized. He said, what was the sculpture meaning? said, look at there. said, why, well, there's no sufferings, there's nothing, it just looks like plain. Just a, and he, while he was criticizing it to his wife, the guide walked up and said, Mr. Sproul, perhaps you're criticizing that, the, the work of the sculpture. He said, yes. He said, I don't see why he hung that up there. It doesn't look uh, anything like it would uh, show any sufferings of Christ. He said, sir, it's the way you're looking at it. He said, now, it's got an altar down here. So now you come down here and now kneel down. And he kneeled down. So now look up. Oh, he said his heart would break. There was the features of the suffering and all of Christ when he looked up. He said, you see, sir, it's the way you're looking at it. And that's the same way it is by the word of God, brethren. It's the way you're looking at it. If you stand off and look at it from an observation of, and a point of criticism to say, this guy hasn't got it and that guy hasn't got it. It won't work. It's to get down and look up to. That brings the results. Then you have a different attitude, and a different attitude towards your brethren, and a different attitude towards the man who's striving for the same thing that you're trying to strive for, see. It, it breaks down all barriers then. And now, I don't want to over-talk you, and I hope I'm not boring you, but just a little testimony here of the Lord Jesus and his goodness and mercy, so that you will know that this marvelous gospel hasn't changed. Christ still lives, brethren. And the thing that you men are so earnestly contending for this morning, why, it's just as real today as it ever was. It's, it, he has, it's just the same word of God that Paul preached, that Peter preached, that the prophets had, and so forth. It's God's eternal word. And it can never fail because it's God. And Someone was speaking this morning about the uh, African campaign in the book, I believe, uh, Brother Bose and many of the others, about an article, I believe, it's someone read or something that started the wheel of rolling or something. Well, however, I thought maybe I'd just give you a little testimony of something that happened. And if you read that article and knowing what happened, I thought I would drop over to something of a testimony that happened in India. Maybe you're interested in our Lord's work because we're just laborers out here in the harvest that's gathered in this morning for another tree for a little rest and a time of fellowship together. And when I had been very much constrained to, to go to India, and yet as many of you might know, the Indian trip wasn't a success that it should have been because I failed to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit and never recognized it after he gave me a vision to go to Africa first and then to India. And, and some of the brethren said, oh, just we can't get Africa together, so Brother Roberts has just been down there, so uh, take off to India. And under the influence of my brethren, well, maybe taught, but no matter what someone influences you, if God has told you something different, and now judge it by the word, see, by the word. 
and then go. You know, we're not supposed as, as prophets together, we are to help one another, but never tell one another what to do. Many of you have read Second Kings 13, no doubt or what got in trouble there, and a lion killed the prophet because he, he listened to the a real true prophet because God had commissioned him, God comes first, always. And, when, and then let that be, if you know whether it's God or not, judge it by the word, always. If it's not just exactly with the word, be leery of it, see. We're living in a horrible time, brethren, when this jambies and jambies withstood Moses, see. Now, it's predicted. We can't stop that, brethren. And our, our American people being so much on the television frolic and, and the fantastics and our Hollywood evangelistic types and a lot of a show, Asian backwoods, sassafras preaching, you know. I don't like this color and stuff that they, to, to appease the Ameri- even in other countries as you missionaries know. They say to me over there, isn't there any nice women in America? All your songs are so vulgar about your women. And all of our things, is, I'm not calling any names. This is brethren, such as the Arthur Godfrey and the Elvis Presley and all that their nonsense that's produced and put out to the American people's minds is contaminated with such stuff. And then it even gets into ministry and they try to flower the pulpit. Did you realize that's exactly what Cain done? You know where that come from? Cain. He had an altar the same as Abel did. He worshipped just the same as Abel did, but he beautified it. You notice what Satan did, Lucifer, in heaven? Wanted a better and a more beautiful kingdom, did you see? It's always been that way. Did you know it's Moab up on the mountain and Israel, the holy roller, down in the valley? See? How did both of them had seven altars, seven sacrifices, both of them with seven bullocks and both of them with seven rams speaking of the coming of Christ. Fundamentally, they were just as right Moab was as Israel was down here. But brethren, where, where Balaam failed to see was the signs and wonders following these believers down here, you see. God was in the camp. They had a smitten rock, a brass serpent, a pillar of fire. The supernatural was with them. And so has it been all along and predicted as Jambes and Jambes withstood Moses, so will this in the last day. We got to have it. But I got better hopes of you, brethren, here this morning, that you'll be man of God who stay with the word of God and let everything else fall right to left, but stay right with that word. Don't move. No matter if you're a doormat out there, be a good doormat. Don't try to compete with someone else or do this. Just get right in the Word and stay right there, and God will positionally place you into His kingdom where you can be the best. What if my finger ever taken a notion because it wasn't an eye, it wouldn't be a finger anymore? I would hate to lose that finger. Though my eye may be more valuable, but I love that finger. It's a part of me. You understand what I mean? I'm sure you do. So whatever office, whatever it might be, be whatever you are and where God has positionally placed you. Stay there and be as loyal to that word as you know how to be. God will bless it. If he takes a notion for something else, he'll place you where he needs. But I'm afraid that many times in our moves, our, our, many of our brethren, just as humanistic as it was, when there's a mixed multitude went up with, with the Israels, why, so when the Israelis went out of Egypt, there was a mixed multitude, and they went, the phenomena had been done. and. That's, it's a human element, and if we can just get away from that human element. And that's why, what this morning the breakfast means to me, sitting here. As you men, perhaps Dr. Vail might have invited all he could get a hold of to come to the breakfast, but because if the Lord moves in a supernatural, oh, it's spooky. See, I ain't got nothing to do with that. I wouldn't degrade myself. Did, to associate with such. Did you know that was the attitude of the Pharisees? Did you realize that that's what they did? Do you know God never takes his spirit? He takes his man, but never his spirit. His spirit comes from, the spirit was on Elijah, come up on Elisha, come up on John the Baptist, and so forth. And the fulfilling of all of it was in Christ. He had the spirit without measure. And, that, and do you know the devil takes his man, but never his spirit? His teacher. 
this theologian just comes right on down all the way from Cain all the way down through the Bible just right on down rotating but brethren in regards to that as many times I have questioned it to go into places to hold me where I think that man usually of a Bible education of a scholar that certainly would stand on the Word of God and see fantastics come in of all kinds of things that was just as the Bible said and people with scars in their foreheads and, and blood in their faces and, and uh, all kinds of oils running from their hands and uh, all kinds of uh, fantastics and they'd come in like that and you know people would flock to that and I thought oh God and the unadulterated gospel being preached and just a few would listen but he said to me what is that to thee follow thou me see? that's right these things has to be see so then we're living in that day brethren let's keep our eyes on Calvary keep our hearts single with the word preach the word be in season out of season hold to that unchanging word and stay when we landed in India under difficult the Bishop of the Methodist Church come to meet me many others and they told me that my setup was wrong uh, coming in that uh, the wrong group had sponsored me and so forth and wanted me to turn my sponsorship from them over to this other group and I said brethren as a man of honor I must keep my word that's right I've been falsely advertised many times in different places uh, brother the reason that's happened is because uh, I don't have any paper of my own I don't have a television program I don't have uh, this or that uh, I've tried to keep myself where that I could come to a little church or a big church or wherever the Lord would lead me now someone said the other day I don't know whether I've told you or not I was speaking in a place where a man said now we ask brother Roberts to come he said you're too small ask another brother to come you're too small and another brother you're too small cause it's just a little church he said brother Branham come I happened to be in the room and heard that so I walked out and I said listen brethren <clears throat> the brother was very nice in saying that but the reason brother Robert didn't come not because he didn't want to but because a man that has to is under an obligation as brother Roberts has now God know I didn't have the intelligence that brother Roberts got to know how to put a program together but look what that man has to have if he stays on television look what that man has to have if he stays on radio look at the obligation that man's got and because that he has to have a lot of money don't condemn the man for that the bootleggers take it out you know what they do with it and other things take place help the man he's God's servant and he's trying his best to spread the gospel in a way that I couldn't do it each one has a ministry see each one has his ministry I said and brother Roberts and these other brethren would be glad to come but they can't be called but I said myself God knew that I didn't know much so he just let me where I could be little and and wouldn't have to have any money and uh, I could just go along and if he wants to send me over there he has to let somebody back me up and send me so he wants me to go I, I can go because he'll put on somebody's heart to sponsor me for that one time so that just settles it you see so then in here when we hit the place they said drop your sponsorship and I said no as a man of honor I must keep my word well he said you're going to do a lot of harm in India I said but look he said turn and go back and they begin to tell me all about how it would do hindrance and so forth but I said look wash women washing over a washboard has sent me over here man who's worked in the factory with their dirty greasy hands as went down in their pocket and took a dollar out to send me over here Amen. and fathers with little children maybe that needed shoes took the dollar that would have bought the shoe for the baby and sent me over here I said gentlemen I, I'm in my Christian heart I couldn't look them in the face again to know that I'd misused the money that was sent over here to come preach the gospel to these people I said you forgive me if in some of your politics and so forth if I've got mixed up and I didn't know that was a manager I had nothing to do with it I just come I said but I come to preach the gospel and to help the needy I said I have some money here in my pocket that I must give personally to the poor cause people has given it to me to give to the poor personally and I must do it 
I shall never forget it. When I went out in the street and got the dollars changed to rupees and started into the street, while well, they almost had to get the police to get me. It was a, oh my, you'll never know what those things look like till you get there once and see the poor in the, oh. But here's what doesn't. Here's the idea. And ministers, listen to this. Let us draw just a picture. Here's the old man sitting there with a little loincloth on him, a little tub, a little puddle of water. He takes his water from there to, to drink, and his wife totes it to the house if she's going to wash the dishes or what more, or cook. And he has a few stalks of food that he's growing. And we tell him that uh, we are brothers. His skin is dark, and, and the white man comes over. And when we come over and get off of the boat in a great big golden strip Cadillac and drive down the street and the beggar brother lays on the street and asks for a coin, I've seen it with my own eyes, the snoopiness of the American people turned their back. I seen something one day that astounded me, a little boy with a toe about that big and about that big around, dragging his little club foot, a man with no arms from lepers. And so I was throwing rupees out to see what they would do with it. And I thought, Billy said to my son, how would that poor man ever pick it up? And them screaming, mothers with their little babies and their little bellies swelled out like this from starving to death. She'd do anything. She don't mind dying, but oh, feed that baby. There's 470 million of them and almost 400 million beggars. And here we are today, dressed in God's servants, sitting here and fussing and arguing about little difference in our denominations and millions dying every day out there that's never heard the gospel one time. When I throw my films on the other night and seen those poor little African boys there that had never had a decent meal in their life and their little arms mangy and naked in all kind of conditions holding their hands up and wanting me to tell them of Jesus once more before leaving. And then to think that we would argue about whether we should be this way or that way or whether we should be Presbyterian or Baptist. Oh, shame on us, man of God. Amen. How we differ in splitting ideas and such as that going on. And Jesus died. That little boy got just as much right to eat good food and wear good clothes as my children have or your children have. He's a product of God that God created and he's God's creation. And it's not right for us that there are great fine churches and building millions of dollars of uh, churches and putting tens of thousands of dollars of pipe organs in them and the missionary begging for money to go to the field to bring the gospel and preaching the Lord's coming soon. Brethren, something is wrong. You know that is right. And look here, I'd like to say something to you with reverence and respect. What made India is going to turn communism pretty soon if you don't watch? Why is it? Because that we have put the penny march for the missionary to go over and give our money to the beer caps and so forth like that and the dives and things in this nation. And we have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. When that man sits there and his arms folded and this man come by and shun him and walk past, and yet the missionary tries to tell him that he is our brother and would we treat a brother like that? Because of his color, because of his nationality. Oh, brother, don't you see that same arrogant spirit gets amongst denominations and denies Christian brotherhood in the same way? We are the products of God, every one of us, and we should be brothers closely knitted together by the gospel and our motives and our ideas and everything we should give to God for the, the relief and the furthering of the gospel and the bringing together of a, a brotherhood and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That afternoon, the mayor of Bombay that estimated tens of thousands times thousands had gathered in. I felt like a hypocrite if I'd have come home without preaching to them at least a few times. So they told me I, there'd been a lady over there before me that had done something and got some people, two men, killed in a riot. And uh, so uh, they wouldn't let me have the meetings outside the city. It was against the city ordinance unless I go out and went plumb up to Delhi, uh, New Delhi. And there's where I'm going this year, the Lord willing, where they got an ample theater there that I can put a million people in it. And so there's estimated nearly a half a million would have been at this meeting here in uh, Bombay. 
all they were from everywhere, strode on the roads like it was in Africa and so forth. Brother, where are the carcasses, the eagles will be gathered. Jesus said, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its Savior, till I'm a Presbyterian, and that settles it. Or I'm a Pentecostal, and that settles it. Then it's lost its Savior. Amen. See, Amen. salt creates a thirst. And thirst can only, salt can only be a savior as it contacts. You just be salty. God will make the world thirsty if you'll be salty. That's right. And then in the meetings as they come, that afternoon they asked me if I would come to, a re- to represent a Christian religion before a gathering in the Temple of the Gems. Uh, some of you missionaries, I may not pronounce that right. I've heard, Forget how it's spelled J E I N double N or something like that. Jans or Jans, it's a religion. And um, that afternoon, many different religions had gathered there because they knew I was coming. And there they'd taken our shoes off and walked into this heathen temple. And as I walked in there, and they sat on the pillows, and there sat their pope or their big man with his feet pulled up, and their monks there with their whiskers pulled out and pulling the hairs in their head. Little mops they were making because. They mopped the street, afraid they'd step on an ant or a little bug, and it might be their papa, mama, or their uncle or aunt, and reincarnation they believe in. And I looked all over that place, and I seen their different peculiar dresses that represented their different religions, and I thought, oh, Jesus, what would you do if you walked in here? Okay. That them were man. They, they eat like we do. They have wives like we have. They have blood like we have. They might could save our life with a blood transfusion, as Christ saved all of our lives by his blood transfusion. They have children. They're products of God. They're just, they're just got all mixed up because of false teachings, because we fail with the gospel. Now, if we go there and pass our tracks, tracks is wonderful. I have nothing against it, and I'm for it, but that ain't what Christ said. If we go over and teach theology, that's wonderful, nothing against it. That's what we should do. But we got to have more than that for the heathen. Go take more than that. We sent missionaries in there for years. That's right. And what have we gotten? Nothing to count for. Speaking at Aquinas here recently, when Dr. Davis, the one that ordained me and laid hands on me at the Missionary Baptist Church as a little preacher, and the night that I saw the vision of the Lord when he told me about this message, and I went and told Dr. Davis, he said, Preach the gospel around the world. For the grammar school education, I suppose you believe that, Billy. I said, With all my heart, Dr. Davis. He said, Billy, you, you need a rest, son. I said, Maybe you better go home and rest. I said, Dr. Davis, I don't appreciate that. I said, I've been a loyal member of the Baptist Church, but I said, I'm a loyaler to my Lord Jesus. I said, I shall give up my fellowship then. Uh, you'll always be my brethren, but I won't attend another fellowship meeting. If that's the attitude the Baptist Church takes of an angel of God that compares with the gospel, and Paul said, if one come teaching anything else, let him be accursed, but this angel declares the true gospel on the word. Amen. And Dr. Davis, I want you to defy it somewhere with the word. He couldn't do it. He said, Billy, did you eat something for supper that night? He said, did you have a nightmare? I said, all right, Dr. Davis. But not long ago, sitting at a Kiwanis meeting where I was speaking, there were doctors and so forth as setting Dr. Davis' presence. And how he told me, he said, you're going to be a holy roller, the first thing you know, Billy. And when I had the privilege of standing there, I said, Dr. Davis, greeting you. But what you call fanaticism, our Baptist church has spent millions of dollars in sending missionaries into Africa. Where did I find them? Out at the compound. That's right. Out there where there's a, a few of the people that's gathered in from the tribesmen and has come in and have uh, done something that they would not be associated with their tribes. They have a stricter religion and our, and what we practice Christianity. If they do anything, if a girl's found immoral or something, she can't no longer stay in the tribe. 
No, sir. She takes off tribal paint and she goes into the city. She has to make her way the best she can. And one of the tribes, if she's found guilty, she has to tell who done it, and they're both killed together. They have a stricter than what we do, and them heathen. And to see them walking with their little, I said, when I went into Africa, our, many of them find them with, and our Baptist people with a little idol under arm. Said, well, if a moya, a moya means an unseen force, like the wind. If he fails, this won't. Papa packed it and he set it down, built up a little fire, and the lion went away when he said the prayer. I said, the lion never run because of the prayer. The lion run because of the fire. I said, I'm a hunter. I know that animals are scared of fire. It never had nothing to do with it. And so he, but oh, he would keep it anyhow. But that afternoon when they seen the God of the Bible, brethren, come down into action, 30,000 raw heathens broke their idols on the ground and received the Lord Jesus Christ. See, that's the idea. Not passing tracks, but preach the gospel. Demonstrate the power of the Holy Spirit. And you man have it in your reach. It's in you. Now, watch. And in India that day, when they went into the temple, and they got up, they began to speak to different ones, and they began to belittle Christianity. How they said... Now, they had a lot of good points. Certainly they do. They had a good point. One of them said, How do you who call yourself religious Christians that believe in a God and all your science is used to create atomic bombs to blow one another up and then call yourself religious? I said, You have a point there. That's right. But all they create atomic bombs are not Christians. That's right. I said, that is right. We Christians would never blow one another up. Born again Christians. But you can see their points. That's just one of them, you see. What their points are. But they kept saying, our religion was before this. And your Christ, he said, Christ come over the Indian belief. That Christ learned his philosophy from a Buddha priest. See, and all that. So I had to stand up. I'd have been a traitor to Christ if I hadn't. I don't care what kind of a temple I was in. I raised up and I said, you're an error. How could you ever, could I ever teach you a blood sacrifice when you won't even kill a gnat? I said, how could you ever accept a blood sacrifice? I said, I asked you to be at the service this evening. And that evening when they'd all gathered and the ray jaws on their pillows and the religious leaders and we take him two hours and something beating through the crowds to get in with the, the Boy Scouts and the all different, I guess they look like Boy Scouts and something, have a, I guess it's National Guards or something with their sticks and things to get you through the crowds, through the places till we got to a place where I could speak from. And there, standing in the place with an interpreter and the poor lepers laying piled on each other. Oh, what a sight, and someone with no arms and eyes to eat out and their ears gone, and such a, such a mass of humanity, and suffocating, and at nighttime coming down, packing them on top of their head and dumping them in a salamander with no John 3.16 or I am the resurrection and life, saith God. Mortal beings that Christ died for, thousands of them dying to pick them up on the street like cardboard and cremate their bodies. No ceremony or nothing, know who they belong to. They just dump them in. That settles it. And we are arguing whether we should do this or do that or how we should tie our shoes or what kind of a tie we should wear or something. It's a disgrace, brethren. It is. And all of our, if human, if the church is only governed by man's theology, then it don't take the Holy Ghost. That's right. But the, the church is not to be governed by human theology. The Holy Spirit is to run the church. Amen. We're not to be filled with education and man's theology. We're to be filled with the Spirit of God and to be led by, not the bishop, but by the Holy Spirit. Right. Or not by any denominational leaders, but by the Holy Spirit, right. brethren. There's the failure. I'm not saying this arrogant. I'm saying this in brotherly love to absolutely make a point straight and to show a truth. That's what I'm trying to get to you, is the truth. There's not a denomination in the world I wouldn't take off my hat, let it be Jehovah Witness or Roman Catholic. I wouldn't take off my hat anybody that names the name of Jesus Christ and respects 
how to respect that brother and stay by him as long as breath stays in my body. But I'm saying we're segregating our people and making differences when we shouldn't do that. We should be together. They were all in one accord in Acts 2. And brethren, just in closing, may I say this because I'm over time now. I'm sorry to keep you this long. I'm, I didn't mean to do it. But to a point, that night at the church, the brethren, when we were all standing there on the platform, you couldn't hear yourself think, you know, how it would be. There was hundreds of different tribesmen and everything else in there. And they were scattered all down the roads expecting me to stay for two weeks when I could only stay three days because the, the, the mobs were so great they couldn't place them in the city. And they asked me to that I'd have to go somewhere else because he couldn't take care of it. You see, it's just, it just terrible. And I told him, I will return by the grace of God, and I will. So that night, standing, I was watching for the Holy Spirit. You've read my story of Africa, all of you in the book, waited to that crippled man with his hands down when he walked like an animal, you know, and when the 30,000 received Christ. I waited, and a man come through, which was a leper, the first one. You could give out no prayer cards. My, the boys tried to give prayer cards and closed the door off of them. See? So I said, just like it was in Africa, just let the missionaries pick out, go down and get some from this tribe and some from that tribe and some from this tribe, two or three out of each one and stand them up. And then when we were standing there and they'd, the officers had picked up some to bring through, which they could, some more able, there come through first was a, a man of leper. And standing many times, as you see in the meetings, it calls the people's names and where they're from. Now, that shouldn't be spooky to you, brother. That's the Bible. It's a little contrary to the modern conception of it, but so was Christ contrary to the modern conception of that day. And we know that history repeats itself. And there, the man, I'd see their name. I couldn't pronounce it. I could just spell it out as I seen him. And they'd tell them what they were and so forth. I would pray for the person and pass them through. And you remember, it's nothing that I can do. I'm just a man. See? It's something that isn't me that does this talking. I have nothing to do into it. It's your faith that's doing it. See? Yesterday afternoon, Brother Joseph happened to come into a place, into my room where I was at, just to a little before going to church and it happened to be that three o'clock I start praying and Joseph sitting there a friend of mine we've been together for a long time there come a vision but Joseph because we love one another and at times that we've been together never has there been but the Holy Spirit reveals something to brother Joseph that there he is asking to see showing just what had taken place and so forth isn't that right Joseph right. See? He, it's something is more happens outside than there is in the church see? but it's the people in the church are using God's gift see it's just as I explained it to the doctor I believe yesterday would you bear me just another minute oh, sure. <laughs> here so you you have a right to know this uh, brethren sisters you have a right to know this you're here you're shepherds I don't blame you from holding back your shepherds. I don't blame minister, Baptist ministers and Presbyterian ministers and so forth, anything from seeing something holding back because they are shepherds. They're feeding a flock. And they've got to watch what their flock eats. Mm -hmm. But what a shepherd ought to do, the Pharisees were shepherds too. But they should have looked to the Scripture as Nathaniel did, and as the woman at the well of Samaria, and looked at the scriptures and seen what day they were living and said, this is the food. See, but now look, the Bible said, before I finish my story on India, because I want you to get that, the Bible said that the Christ, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. God and Christ were one. They were one. And not as they were one as your finger, as we've had frictions on that too when it ought not to have never been. 
And today we hold grudges. I don't think that preachers do. It's a congregation. Did you notice the order of Second Timothy 4? They shall heap for themselves together teachers, having itching ears, and be turned from the truth, the word, to fables and fantastics and so forth. I don't think it's the ministers. I've gathered with hundreds of them. I see them reach across the table of the different denominations, shake one another's hands and be brothers. See, it's the, it's the sheep that's blading wrong. See? Now, God gave Christ the Spirit without measure. Is that right? That's right. The fullness of God was in Christ. He was God Emmanuel. We know that. There's no, there's no doubt in our minds of that. Just like, as I said yesterday, the whole ocean full of water, all the waters in the ocean, was in Christ. But this little gift that you see working here is just a teeny, little, teeny bit of, like that, on the spoon laying there. Just a drop. I can see it. But in Christ was the fullness of God. We have it by measure. He had it without measure, the Bible said. See? Without measure. No, he's just limited, unlimited. He had the Spirit of God. Now the subject is water. Now one day, when God, knowing that his Spirit dwelt fully in Christ, he wanted to use his, his gift that was in a man, the corporal body called Jesus, which was his dwelling place. The body is a tabernacle. God was tabernacling here on earth. Do you believe that, brethren? In the body Christ. Now, God wanted to use his gift, so he showed his son to leave the home of Lazarus and Martha and them and to go away for several days because Lazarus was going to die. And after the appropriated days that the Father, because Jesus said, I do nothing in myself but what I see the Father doing, John 5, 19, as I've referred to it many times. Jesus only did what the Father showed him. Is that right? The Bible said what? Jesus said so. And that settles it. Now, then when God picked up his gift and took it over here and stayed it away until the amounted time was finished, and he looked over to his disciples and said, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth. He knew the time was fulfilled. He said, Well, if he sleepeth, he doeth well. He's taken a sleep or rest. He said, but he's dead, and for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there, because they'd be trying to get him to pray for him, which would be contrary to the will of God. See, we've got to follow God. As the sister said of her husband, the footsteps of the righteous is order of the Lord. Now, he said, I'm glad I wasn't there, but I go waking. You get it? Look at the grave. He said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast already heard me. See? But for these that stand by, I said it, Lazarus come forth, and the man had been dead four days, stood on his feet and lived again. We believe that to be authentically the word of God, the truth. In a few days, a woman, a little woman, insignificant, probably a little farmer's wife, who is perhaps in a time of menopause, uh, had a, an issue of blood come through, and she believed that that was God in there. She believed that that was God. So she said, if I can only, as Brother Roberts has said many times, get a point of contact. If I can only get my point of contact, I'm going to touch his garment and I'll be made whole because I believe if I can get any touch of that, God's in there. See? And when Christ was touched physically, materially with the woman's hand, God inside gave a witness. He said, who touched me? Who touched me? Everybody denied it. But being the fullness of God in there, he looked around with that discernment. He could perceive their thoughts. Is that right? That's right. I want to ask you, brethren, something now while we're together. What is the difference of perceiving a thought or reading a mind? You see, the mind readers, the psychic readers, are uh, the, all those things would have been real gifts of God, but they're perverted. The devil can't create nothing. He just perverts what God has created. It's, what is righteousness? What is sin? It's righteousness perverted. 
I want to make a point, excuse me, sisters. You married man. It's legal and righteous. You have a wife that you have married. And in the legal procedure of human life, you can live with your wife, make love to her, and she is, a, she is your wife. And that's just as legal. And the Bible said the bed is undefiled. But the prostitute or the unrighteous woman can be just the same thing as your wife was. But to go with her is to pervert what righteousness into unrighteousness. You understand what I mean? I thought maybe that remark would get you to where you can see what I'm speaking of. Unrighteousness is righteousness perverted. The devil cannot create. That's the reason the devil can't heal. Only God can create, and he's the only one that can heal. See, the devil can pervert but cannot create. So then the woman touched his garment, and she was satisfied. She ran off, and Christ looked around or the audience until he found the woman, knew what her trouble was, and then she confessed that she, what she had done. Now look, he said, I perceive that I got weak, or virtue, virtue is weakness, taking virtue from you. Now what happened? God used his gift, God used his gift, and he, when he used his gift, Christ never said a thing about being weak when he raised the dead man had been dead four days. God used his gift. But here the woman used his gift. Not God, the woman drawn from Christ, what through through Christ, drawn from God through Christ, she used the gift of God that was in Christ. You see? Now the question's going to arise, why does Brother Bram get weak when you leave the meeting? Uh, sure you can understand now. Here, as I said to the brother the other day, we're all little boys and we're at a circus. None of us has got money to go in. <laughs> but it happens to be maybe that I would be a little taller than you. You're a little stronger than I. And God made us all different because he's a God of variety. Do you believe that? That's right. He makes big mountains and little mountains, and he makes deserts, and he makes uh, oceans, and he makes white flowers, and he makes blue flowers, and he makes red flowers. He makes little men, big men, red-headed, black-headed, blue-headed. He makes yellow, brown, black men. He, he's a God of variety. He's not a Sears and Roebuck Harmony house. He's, he's, a, he's a God of variety, see. Uh, now, he makes a variety because that's what he likes. I like the way he likes it. I like because he likes it. And when he's in here, you like the things that he likes. That's the reason I love nature in its primitive condition. Now, we notice. Now, there's a, maybe he made me just a little bit taller. Now, I can't help because I was taller. You can't help because you're stronger. You can do things for him that I can't do. I can do things for him that you can't do. Oh, Roberts, myself, you, all the rest of them, we are all different one from another, but we're all brothers. See, we're all brothers for the same purpose. Now, maybe that we want to see this carnival. Now, all you brothers said, Brother Branham, hey, you're the tallest. Maybe you can see visions. That was just a gift. I never made myself thus. He made it that way. That don't make me any different from anybody else or you different from me. We're all the same material. But it's the way God has made us. Well, now, you say, way up about this tall is a knot hole. It's way above my head. Now you say, Brother Branham, what's in that bill? What's coming on over there? I don't know. Well, jump up and see. Well, I'll reach up and grab a hold of and I'll squeeze and pull myself up. I'll look you down. <sighs> what do you see, Brother Bram? An elephant. Oh, you did. Uh huh. Look again, Brother Bram. Oh, my. All right. Jump up and grab it. A hold by my finger. What do you see, Brother Bram? A giraffe. Whew. Yeah. That's on the platform. See? That's you, like this woman, your faith pulling from God. That's forcing a vision. See it? It's you doing it. That's what weakens. That's what the woman does. It weakens. See? It weakens. Because it was the woman doing something herself that took the virtue. Now, what if the strong man, the owner of the circus, he walks by and says, Hello, Billy, and I say, how do you do, sir? What are you doing? I was uh, looking through this novel. 
Oh, yeah. What else did you see, Brother Branham? Oh, my. Looked like he could be satisfied with wanting me to tell him there's an elephant in there. What? This person here. It's a strain. That woman's a coming. Here she comes. There's something meets you. It burst. It's a woman doing it. The man doing it before me. It's not me. It's her doing it. I'm just standing there yielding myself. This thing's a dumb mute unless some live voice is speaking in it. And that's the way we are. There's an organ and a piano, but it's, it, it's silent till somebody plays it. And that's us. That's me. I, I, I can't do that. See? It's you using God's gift. See? That's in the meeting. It shouldn't be. I shouldn't be doing it. It's just God. If you notice, I say it's God permitting. See? It's not a gift of healing. Or Roberts has the gift of healing. I do have a gift of healing, like you ministers, to bring the people up there and pray for them. But that's just a faith that just bulldog faith that takes a hold like that. But sometimes you let things go by. See? But this way, it's a prophetic gift that searches that soul. See? And you know. See? Maybe 500 wouldn't go through. That's right. But when one comes through, he's combed down. You've been in the meetings and seen him how sin and say, that man sitting right under you live with him. You did this over here and so forth. You've seen it in the meetings and know it. See? That's right. See? You can't take them just as fast as you can. You have to watch. It's the people's own faith. Now here's someone from here. Here's someone out here. Here's someone over here. See what I mean? Now, that's, now what if the ringmaster comes by? And I'm just, oh, brother, two people done went through it, told him this. What else did they have? The person will stand there. Yes, I, I got cancer. Mm -hmm. That's right. What do you see? The person, cancer. Oh. Yes. That, was that right, sister? I don't even remember. It's just, yes, that's right. Well, where she ought to say, thank you, Lord. I accept it now as my healing. And walk away. They'll wait a little while. <laughs> Something else. Then here it goes again. Here it goes again. The audience sits and says, well, that's pretty nice. But in Africa, they don't say that. In India, they don't say that. When they see that, oh, hallelujah, they say it. It's, it's real, see? And away they go. 25,000 was healed at one prayer in Africa. Seven van loads of crutches and wheelchairs that moved out on one prayer. They believed it. They wasn't indoctrinated with all of our theology and our embalming fluid that we put into them, you see. They were, they were believed when they seen that crippled man raised up and all, most of them noting there in the Shunga tribe or the Zula rather, and when they seen that, that settled it, brother, they just left their crutches and things and walked right out praising God. That was it. But, oh, we say, now, wait a minute. How, wait a minute. That could be mental telepathy. Oh, that could be hypnotism. Mm, hypnosis. That, I tell you, Dr. Jones said, I, I, I'll very be careful about that. Oh, no. See, therefore, we can't get nowhere. See, that's the reason that our hearts go for that country. That's when I'm among brethren. I say, brethren, if you are not called for a missionary, get somebody in your church to uh, uh, do everything you can. Support somebody that is over there. Do something about it. See, you can't be wrong in being a missionary. The general orders is going to all the world. Now, here comes a ringmaster by. So what are you doing, Billy? I say, ah, I, I was looking through the knothole. Or what do you want to see? I want to show you something, Billy. He picks me up with a nap of the neck, raises you up here, and he said, You see over here how that takes place? It goes down here, and there's where this tent is, and that's where this is. Oh, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, that's it. Mm hmm. I see what you mean. Uh huh. Now, when he sets me down, I'm not tired. <laughs> Didn't bother me. <laughs> see? But when, see, there's the difference. When God used his gift and took Jesus away and told him what was going to happen, and he raised the dead man, he never said anything about being tired. But when the little woman touched his garment, he said, virtue went out from a blood issue. <laughs> you see the difference? It's God using his gift, man using his gift. Now, Christ had the Spirit without measure. Now, that was Christ, the whole ocean. This little gift that's in your servant here, brother, is just a little drop out of the ocean. It's in measure. But remember, the same chemicals that's in the entire ocean is in that spoon, that little drop. But it's not as much of it, see? And so our ministries are the chemicals that's made up in the, the great economy of God. And God can use those chemicals the way he wants. It's just not as much of it. 
But altogether, it's more of it than was in the one. See, the fullness of God is in His church, but we have the Spirit with ma- with major. Now, that's what makes the weakness. That's what it is. It's, it takes place. That's the reason I don't stay long on the platform. That's the reason they watch me. I faint almost. I well, now it's seem like stepping off the world. You're coming out of another world. You're coming down here. But what does it declare? There is a land beyond the river, brother, beyond any shadow of doubt. We're not in any kind of a fiction. We're not in some kind of a mythical hoodoo hypnotism. It's a resurrected Christ proving himself. Standing that night on the platform after three or four went by, here come a blind man. And he stood, and I'm closing. There was a blind man came by, and he was blind. It called his name, told him who he was. And then under that anointing, you can feel the Spirit. I can feel it in the meeting there. Where you can tell where that darkness, coldness, and difference are setting you see like that. But I used to. I'd call him out. I'd say, what are you disbelieving for, you, you so-and-so, you Presbyterian preacher? And the first thing you know, if you root up the weed, you pull the wheat with it. So it's best just to leave it alone. See? Just go ahead. Do your work. What's that to thee? Follow me. Yeah. See? Just do what you're supposed to do, and that's go ahead. So then... Uh, now, I didn't mean no altogether Presbyterian, many times Pentecostal preachers. That's right. Unbelievers, just as much as there is anywhere else, brother. That's right. Yeah. So then, when they, uh, now they'll come to you. That's what hurts. They'll come to you. Brother Brandon, we love you. And you know that's wrong. See them right there and watch that spirit, feel it. Just sit and talk to the men a few minutes and watch that vision work above there. <laughs> I, I'd rather not see it. I'd rather not know it. I want to believe his testimony is right. Anyway. See, it creates something in you. Uh, what would I call that? Uh, 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 well, it's something that uh, it creates a, 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 a distrust uh, that you don't want to have. You want to love them anyhow, you see. And then that's the reason sometimes I'm a little uh, misunderstood and thinking I'm an isolationist. I'm not. I love my brethren, you see. But I, I want to have keep that love in my heart. I never want it to be broke. See, every man loves me, and I love every man. That, that's the way it is, you see. I want to do that. Then, and when this man came, it told him who he was. It said he was a beggar, and he was a worshiper of the sun. You've heard of it. And told him that he had been blind 20 years. This white is my shirt, his face. That was right. He said that was right. And as I looked to the audience, there sat the Ray Jaw, ever what it was, and now people there, they thought it was the working of a telepathy or something. You could tell it. And I said, is there a doctor present that would like to examine the man, which was no doctor, you can see, totally blind, you see. And I said to him, sir, there's nothing I could do for you. See, I done told him who he was, and that was right. Told him he had two children, and that was right. Told him how long he'd been blind, and that was right. And told him that he was seeking a relief for his eyes, a healing. And that in his heart he said that he would serve any God that would make him well. See, he would serve any God that would make him well. Now, here's what I say for your, that you know you're a God now, brother. See, any God that, and there they sat with at least 15 different religions sitting around. Worship of flies, worship of cattle, worship of this, worship of that. You know how India is. It's just full of superstitions. And there they sat in that condition, all around. And I thought, oh, God. And I said, now, here is the man. He's blind. I, there's nothing I could do to help him. I said, God knows that. And as I looked, he appeared with his eyes looking around, you know, in the vision, rubbing his eyes, smiling. Oh, brother, oh, I only wished I had the vocabulary now or the, uh, the something within me to let you see and know what that means. Such a feeling. See, it's no longer a faith I have to use. It's a drama. God has already said it. All heavens and earth will pass, but his word won't. All the devils out of hell couldn't stop it now. God has said so. That settles it. Like what he told me yesterday morning up there. Oh, I don't care let the waves roar. That has nothing to do with it. The little boy in Finland, all the many places, when God has said so, that settles it. It's thus saith the Lord. Watch it. I thought, oh, God, how I thank you. 
You're still Jehovah. You're still the Almighty. Then I, and I know my position. I know where I was standing then. I don't care how many devils that he set up. There's no failure then. God has done said so. You feel like Elijah on Mount Carmel. Was standing out there when he hollered to the prophets of Baal. Maybe he's gone on a trip. Maybe he's pursuing. Elijah said, I've done this, Lord, at your command. He noted exactly what was going to happen. That's the reason he could say it. Oh, brethren, our religion is not a fiction. It's not some Santa Claus story. It's a real living Jesus. Don't be afraid to put him to the test on his word, because he'll keep his word. And that's right. He'll keep his word. There, when I'd seen that, I thought, oh, God, as it was in Africa, now you're going to do it in India. And I turned to the audience. I said, gentlemen of the religions of India, I could not address them as brethren because they wasn't my brethren. Gentlemen of religions of India, you were telling me today in your temple down there, oh, how God always makes a way. Yes, Yes, sir. Don't fight. Just let him have the way. (laughs) Just let him alone. You just walk on. Follow him. I said, today I was astonished in your temple when you told me how great your gods was and how fictitious mine was. How that the man never died, he got on a horse and rode up to heaven. And I said, but he died. And yeah, he rose again. I said, here stands a man of the worship of the sun who testifies of being blind for 20 years. And I said, he is now here seeking his sight. I said, surely the God who made him, the creator who made him, I said, could give him back his sight. I said, now, of course, you, you, you Sikhs and you Jans and Mohammeds and Buddhists and so forth, you say that he's wrong. But I said, what would you do? You'd say, come over to me. What would you do? You'd change his way of saying his prayer. I said, what would you do? You would only change his philosophy. I said, you, you would have him to worship something else or do something, a change of his way of praying. I said, we have the same thing in America. I said, but that wouldn't help the man. I said, you'd only proselyte him. And I said, if he come over here to change from the worshiper of the sun, which you say he worshiped the creator, creation instead of the creator, that's what he did. And through ignorance he did this. But what would you do if you made him a Jan? What would you do if you made him a Mohammed? I said, why, he would be no better off. He's still blind. And you would only change his, his, his philosophy, his way of praying, change his idea, change his denomination. I said, we got the same thing in America. All the Baptist wants to convert every Methodist he can to the Baptist church. And every Methodist wants to convert the Baptist. And the, the Baptist for the Presbyterian, the Lutheran, the Pentecostal wants to take them all. And I said, that's the way it goes. But I said, what is it? It's purely... Psychology. That's right. But I said, we have one God, where you all have many. But I said, that's the way it is in America. They're proselyting and pulling and fussing and everything, trying to get all to come this, all to come this, and build a million more than 44, and all these slogans and things like that. I said, what is it? It's pure human psychology and building up of organizations. And I said, I challenge, excuse my emotions, I challenge the Buddha priest to come forth and give him his sight. If he'll do it, he'll be a Buddha from this on, and I will too. I said, I challenge the Mohammed priest to come forth and give him his sight. He'll be a Mohammed from now on, and I will too. Oh, brother. <laughs> Our God lives. Yeah. You're in America. You don't come face to face with these things. You have to get into them lands to really. There's where they're watching. See? There's where you've got to show down. Or you can say, I, I can prove I belong to a big organization that has nothing to do with it, brother. That's right. That's right. I said, I challenge any religion here to come give him his sight. 
and he'll join your religion, and so will I. I said, surely the Creator who made him, if he's seen that he's worshipped the creation instead of the Creator, surely he would bring him back to his right conditions to bring him right if he did this through the ignorance of his worship. And I said, that's the quietest crowd I ever talked to. (laughs) Thousands, just as far as you could see, laying there on each other and piled together. It was quiet. Every man sat on his pillow of the great priest and thing. No man made a move. I said, then, gentlemen, why don't you say something? I said, today in the Jan's temple, you told me how little Christianity was and how it was in the minority, and it is. Mohammeds are greater than men. We're about third or fourth, taking Catholics and all of us together. You told us how little we was. But Alan, how big are you? <laughs> oh, we know, Dan. I would have never said that, brother. God knows that. If that vision hadn't have been there, no, sir. But God had said so. And that settled it. That's the same thing took place in Africa. Certainly. I know it wasn't me no longer. I was just his mouthpiece. There it was. That's the same thing took place in Finland in the raise of the dead. Boy, you read the story. Certainly. That's right. He's God. He don't tell his servants all things, but when he wants to use you, he can put his hands on you and take you here and do it. And if you just be humble and stay in your position, he can make more glory out of it than all the diddle daddling long you can do or I can do. That's right. Abide in your calling and stay there until God's ready to move you somewhere. That's right. There, when he stood there, I said, it's all for quiet. I said, why? Because you can't do it. And neither can I. The God of heaven, Jehovah God, has raised up his son, Christ Jesus, who has stood here by me this night and showed me a vision. That this man is going to receive his sight, and it's thus saith the law. If God doesn't give that many sight, I'm a false prophet. And I said, then my religion that I'm representing, I'm falsely representing Christianity. But if the God has said this, then if he does it, how many here will forsake your superstitions and serve the living God who can restore the sight to the blind? And as far as you can see, those hands raised in the air. <laughs> There's the showdown. That's the proof. As the old saying, the proof of the pudding is the eating thereof. There it is. Not our theology, not our psychology, but the proof of the real, true creator who made the heavens and earth. And as the Holy Spirit brewed us from the earth, surely the brewing of the Holy Ghost can restore us back to our right conditions. And there, standing in that place, turning man with a heart just as sure and as much faith as I believe I can walk to that microphone. Yes, sir, because not because it was me, no, brethren, that had nothing to do with it. It was Jehovah God ready to move on the scene. That's right. And he just showed me by a vision through a gift. And he wanted to use it at that time. Surely, before a bunch of heathens, that he would use his gift. There I stand there, walked up to the man and put my hands up on his face like that. I said, Heavenly Father, you who showed the vision a few moments ago, I said, I feel like Paul of old when he was on the ship and said, Be of a good courage. For I know that you will give this man his sight, because thou hast said so, and I have spoke your words, and I, with the, all the wisdom I have, I have made each one promise that they would receive you as personal Savior if you would do this. Now, God, the God who made the heavens and earth, now you who raised Jesus from the dead, as we can stand and see gravitation lose its power, for he's a center of gravitation as he raised that cold form body out of the grave and sent him into glory. Now let it be known that you're God this day. I asked it in the name of Jesus Christ. When I held my hands there, and when the prayer, of course, wasn't interpreted, when I dropped my hand, a man looked. He let out a scream. He grabbed me around the waist. He grabbed the mayor of the city and began hugging him and kissing him. He would just could see as good as any man standing in here. I'm telling you, a frantic a scream went from those people, and the whole thing went into a turmoil. Two or three hours later, they got me through the crowd with the army there trying to push him back. I had no pockets in my coats. My shoes was gone. They'd pulled every clothes off of me, nearly stripping me, screaming and crying. 
And the next day with sorrow, I had to leave India with a promise that I'd be back again. But brother, the commandments of Jesus Christ is just as true today and just as vital. He's just as much resurrected today as he ever was. And he is the same Lord Jesus, and he's with us today. Don't be afraid. Trust the Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as men and women are sitting here together, who are, we are associated in this same blessing. And as I am so happy to stand as the today to tell them what their great Savior is doing in other lands to man who doesn't, hasn't had the privilege of the great visitation of the Holy Spirit. I pray that you'll bless these men and these women. Oh, eternal God, these ministering gifts that's in this group this morning, they belong in Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterian and Pentecostals of different phases and things. Oh, God, may this fellowship that we have this morning in one thing common, may this never leave them. And may whatever position you have placed them in and ordain them into eternal life and given them their positions, may they serve reverently for some glorious day Jesus shall come and all the sorrows and troubles of this world will be taken away and we shall see him. We'll have a body like his own glorious body. And when we sit together over yonder on the other side, oh, what a day it will be. Oh, may each minister in here, may his, may his pulpit, may his sermons, may his ministry be inspired greater. Grant it, Lord, if I have found grace in your sight and as my brethren stand here this morning. Oh, I pray that each of these ministers in here, these ministering spirits, that God hear my prayer. And I pray that you'll purge that gift that's in them. If there are preachers, make them better preachers. If there are evangelists, make them better evangelists. If there are teachers, make them better teachers. If there are pastors, make them better pastors. God grant that they will be filled with the Spirit of God and will be energized by the great supervine that will give them life eternal and power to minister with and to touch the needy world as it so needs today. Forgive us of our shortcomings. Forgive us of our narrow-minded beliefs and little sectarian ideas. And let us be baptized into one big brotherhood, into one big fellowship, that the kingdom of God might be furthered by our coming together this day. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. I am sorry to keep you long, brethren. But it's way late. It's half past ten. No, it's two quarter till eleven. I, I'll pay the extra. <laughs> I am sorry, but I love you.